During the 19th century BC, ancient Egypt was experiencing a time of great prosperity and stability under the rule of the 12th dynasty. This stability was threatened when the reigning pharaoh Amenemhat IV died without a male heir. In response, Egyptian elites made the unprecedented decision to elevate a woman by the name of Sobek Nefru to the role of pharaoh. The crown was traditionally given to a man because they were perceived as the earthly manifestation of the male god Horus. Sobek Nefru's rise to power broke this thousand-year tradition, becoming the first female pharaoh and one of about a dozen women to ever rule Egypt. The 12th dynasty's greatest ruler, Amenemhat III, brought Egypt to the greatest heights it would ever reach during the Middle Kingdom period. After a lengthy rule spanning over 40 years, Amenemhat III died and was succeeded by his only living son, Amenemhat IV, who ultimately ruled for only nine years before dying without an heir, leaving his sister, Sobek Nefru, with the strongest claim to the throne. According to the king list compiled by the 3rd century BC Egyptian priest and historian Manetho, Sobek Nefru was not only Amenemhat IV's sister, but his wife as well. Incestuous marriages were common among ancient Egyptian royals in order to keep power and wealth within the family and away from ambitious rival families. The devastating consequences of incestuous unions left offspring with shorter than average lifespans. This meant that the kingdom frequently underwent periods of instability as power was transferred from one ruler to the next. Much of what we know about Sobek Nefru comes from the limited monuments and artifacts that have been discovered, which include statues, scarabs, seals, beads, and other records. This glazed cylinder seal and steatite scarab inscribed with Sobek Nefru's name provide evidence of her rule. Sobek Nefru is also mentioned in both the Karnak King List and the Saqqara Tablet. However, her name was notably absent from the Abydos King List, along with every other female pharaoh, including Hatshepsut, who is widely regarded as the most powerful and successful female pharaoh in all of ancient Egyptian history. The name Sobek Nefru translates to the beauty of Sobek. This was the first instance of a pharaoh choosing a regnal name associated with the ancient Egyptian crocodile god Sobek. The deity was viewed as the creator of the Nile River and associated with pharaonic power and military prowess. Sobek was also known as the Lord of the Waters and believed to have the power to provide inundation and fertility to the land. The crocodile god grew to great prominence during the Middle Kingdom period and was the central deity of several cults at the time. Sobek Nefru adopted the complete royal titulary traditionally reserved for pharaohs, which consisted of five names symbolizing both worldly power and spiritual might. This is significant because while other women before Sobek Nefru are believed to have held positions of power, such as Queen Regent, none were previously granted the full royal titles that effectively made Sobek Nefru a fully fledged pharaoh in her own right. Sobek Nefru used male titles such as Son of Ra and wore male garments but still chose to retain her femininity in artistic representations. An example of this can be observed on this damaged statue of Sobek Nefru, which shows her wearing a male kilt on top of a female dress. Although her head is missing from this particular statue, Sobek Nefru was known to wear the male headdress as well. There is no evidence to suggest that she attempted to conceal her gender, but likely donned the male pharaoh attire out of respect for tradition. This choice also undoubtedly helped to placate the many critics she likely had at the time. Egyptologists have argued that Sobek Nefru faced intense scrutiny and opposition from Egyptians, who believed that the allowance of a female pharaoh upset the patriarchal system that had long featured a dominant male leader. They likely regarded a female ruler as an offense to Mart, the ancient Egyptian goddess of balance, order, and morality. 
Egyptologists have theorized that women were elevated to the throne to maintain social order during times of crises, but that it was only ever intended to be a temporary measure while a male leader was carefully selected. Egyptian society was generally oppressive toward women, and the reigns of female rulers were often erased from records by their male successors. By most accounts, though, Sobek Nefru succeeded in her endeavors and was considered to be a strong, effective ruler. In her time as pharaoh, Sobek Nefru was tasked with strengthening foreign relations while simultaneously protecting Egypt from its enemies and natural disasters. Sobek Nefru made significant contributions to her father's mortuary pyramid at Hawara, located near the Fayum Oasis. The 5th century BC Greek historian Herodotus was in awe of the structure's complex maze of underground chambers and caverns, which contained over 3,000 rooms. Herodotus wrote of his visit to the pyramid, saying, This I have actually seen, a work beyond words, for if anyone put together the buildings of the Greeks and displayed their labors, they would seem less in both effort and expense to this labyrinth. Even the pyramids are beyond words and each was equal to many and mighty works of the Greeks, yet the labyrinth surpasses even the pyramids. The majority of the pyramids facing stone was later pillaged and used to construct other buildings, a fate shared by nearly all ancient Egyptian pyramids. As a result, this former magnificent structure is now nothing more than an eroded mountain of mud brick where only the foundation of compacted sand and limestone shards remain. Mysteriously, Sobek Nefru's reign ended suddenly when she died in 1802 BC after ruling Egypt for three years, ten months, and twenty-four days, according to the Turin king list written during the reign of Ramesses the Great. With no heir to the throne, Sobek Nefru's short reign concluded the Twelfth Dynasty, and in some Egyptologists' opinion, it also marked the end of the Middle Kingdom's Golden Age. Sobek Nefru's tomb has yet to be discovered, although some have speculated that an unfinished pyramid in Mazguna, north of a complex dedicated to Amenemhat IV, may have been intended to be her final resting place. Through an unrivaled bloodline and an extraordinary break in tradition, Sobek Nefru cemented herself as the first female pharaoh in ancient Egyptian history. During the early 15th century BC, ancient Egypt began its third and final golden age after Pharaoh Amos I, founder of the New Kingdom period, drove out the Hyksos invaders. Amos's great-granddaughter, Pharaoh Hatshepsut, contributed greatly to this age of prosperity by expanding the empire's trade routes and constructing one of ancient Egypt's greatest architectural wonders. Despite her gender, Hatshepsut managed to become one of the most successful pharaohs in all of ancient Egyptian history. Hatshepsut, whose name means foremost of noble ladies, was born in 1508 BC to Pharaoh Thutmose I and Queen Amos. Hatshepsut was raised in the royal courts of Egypt, alongside her sister and two brothers, who all died early on in their lives. After her father's death, Hatshepsut's half-brother, Thutmose II, inherited the throne. As a lesser son to his father, Thutmose II needed a queen of 100% royal blood to legitimize his claim to the throne. Hatshepsut, then 12 years old, was the ideal candidate, so she married her 15-year-old half-brother and became the queen of Egypt. Thutmose II and Hatshepsut had only one child together, a girl by the name of Neferure. With a lesser wife, he later had a boy named Thutmose III, who became heir to the throne. When Hatshepsut's husband unexpectedly died at the age of 31 in 1479 BC, his son and heir was only three years old, leaving Hatshepsut to act as queen regent to the boy pharaoh until he was old enough to rule. Being the daughter, sister, wife, and mother of pharaohs gave Hatshepsut an incredibly powerful claim to the throne. After seven years of acting as queen regent, Hatshepsut decided to fully leverage her compelling position by declaring herself pharaoh of Egypt. Although the strength of her bloodline was without question, her gender was a critical issue. 
To legitimize her position, Hatshepsut proclaimed that she was the daughter of Amun, the Egyptian god of air, and that it was he who intended for her to rule Egypt. She explained that Amun had possessed her father's body on the night of her conception and impregnated her mother. This was an extraordinarily risky move, but it ultimately paid off, aided by the support of high-ranking officials, including a man named Senenmut, the overseer of royal works, who is also speculated to have been Hatshepsut's secret lover. In addition to her exemplary bloodline, divine right, and support from the aristocracy, Hatshepsut sought to further bolster her claim through propaganda, by depicting herself with a male body and a false beard in most sculptures and carvings. Although she had risen to the level of pharaoh, it was still inconceivable for a woman to lead troops into battle, as her father and husband had done. Instead, Hatshepsut decided to use the empire's military to explore new avenues of trade. She sent her forces on an expedition to the land of Punt, a somewhat legendary kingdom at the time where no Egyptian had ventured for over 500 years. Punt's exact location remains a mystery, but it is generally believed to have been located somewhere on the southern shores of the Red Sea or the Horn of Africa. The venture was an overwhelming success, bringing great wealth and prosperity to the empire. Egypt's army returned with an abundance of riches, including gold, ivory, frankincense, and myrrh. Hatshepsut became the first ruler in history to successfully transplant trees from foreign lands. This was accomplished by using baskets to protect the roots on the journey back to Egypt. Hatshepsut is also credited with being the first person in recorded history to grind up charred frankincense and use the resin as eyeliner. Among other trophies brought back were exotic animals such as apes, panthers, and giraffes. This remarkably fruitful expedition did wonders for the female pharaoh's popularity and reputation. The vast increase in commerce provided financial support for another of Hatshepsut's groundbreaking pursuits, architecture. Hundreds of large-scale building projects were commissioned by Hatshepsut all throughout Upper and Lower Egypt. Among these were grand monuments erected at the Karnak Temple Complex, a popular construction site for many generations of pharaohs. Hatshepsut built enormous twin obelisks made of pink granite at the temple's entrance, and dedicated them to the god Amun. One of these obelisks still stands, remaining the tallest surviving obelisk in Egypt, while the other has since fallen and lies broken in two. The uncontested jewel of Hatshepsut's many building projects is the mortuary temple that she had built in her honor, known as Jezer Jezeru, or Holy of Holies. Sculptures within the mortuary temple tell the tale of the female pharaoh's divine birth, and her lucrative expeditions to the exotic land of Punt. The temple inspired subsequent pharaohs to build their own extravagant buildings of worship, but none ever surpassed the grandeur of Hatshepsut's. Her stepson, Thutmose III, later ordered the eradication of Hatshepsut from historical records. The reasons that her legacy was partially obliterated are up for debate. Some Egyptologists believe that it was done out of resentment towards the female pharaoh, However, there is no evidence to suggest this. Hatshepsut did, after all, appoint Thutmose III as head of the empire's army during her reign, and he made no effort to overthrow her in a military coup. Additionally, it wasn't until 20 years after her death that Hatshepsut's image began to disappear from public buildings. Some archaeologists theorize that her successors were merely trying to relegate her role as ruler of Egypt postulating that evidence of a successful female ruler might inspire other women to attempt to rule, which would upset the patriarchal system that had long featured a dominant male leader. The allowance of a female pharaoh might also have been regarded as an offense to Mart, the ancient Egyptian goddess of balance, order, and morality. Alternatively, it may have been done in an attempt to strengthen her step-grandson Amenhotep II's claim to the throne since he had no connection to Hatshepsut's royal bloodline. In any case, attempts to erase her memory from history were ultimately unsuccessful. Egyptologists theorized that Hatshepsut accidentally poisoned herself to death by regularly applying carcinogenic ointment to her skin. A CT scan of her mummy revealed that she suffered from bone cancer during the final years of her life and died in 1458 BC at the age of 50. 
after ruling Egypt for more than 20 years. Hatshepsut was the second pharaoh after her father to ever be buried in the Valley of the Kings, located on the west bank of the Nile River near the city of Thebes. The Valley of the Kings would eventually contain the mummies of over 60 New Kingdom pharaohs from Egypt's 18th, 19th, and 20th dynasties. Through an impeccable bloodline and brilliant strategy, Hatshepsut successfully rose to power despite her gender and went on to become one of the greatest pharaohs in ancient Egyptian history. During the 14th century BC, ancient Egypt underwent radical religious reforms under the reign of the heretical pharaoh Akhenaten. His great royal wife and queen of Egypt, Nefertiti, was a powerful and influential figure during this time of profound cultural upheaval and even rose to the rank of co-pharaoh and eventually sole pharaoh of Egypt. Her beautiful and elegant limestone bust has rendered her one of the most iconic and legendary figures from the ancient world. Nefertiti is believed to have been born in 1370 BC, but her parentage is still somewhat of a mystery. One theory asserts that she is the daughter of a top advisor named Ai, who went on to become pharaoh following Tutankhamun's reign. A major flaw in this theory is that neither Ai nor his wife Tay are ever clearly referred to as the parents of Nefertiti. Tay's only documented relationship to Nefertiti was that of a nurse of the Great Queen, which is an unusual designation for the mother of an Egyptian queen. Another theory proposes that she was the daughter of Amenhotep III, thereby making her the full sister of her husband, Akhenaten. This is also unlikely because none of Nefertiti's known titles are among those generally given to the daughter of a pharaoh. The newest theory to gain some traction among Egyptologists links Nefertiti to a Mitanni princess named Tatu Kipa, who was initially married to Akhenaten's father, Amenhotep III. This is due in part to the meaning behind Nefertiti's name, the beautiful woman has come, which has been speculated to imply a foreign origin. Nefertiti married Prince Amenhotep IV when she was 15 years old, several years before he became pharaoh and changed his name to Akhenaten. Despite the pharaoh having multiple wives, records show that Nefertiti and Akhenaten shared a close and intimate relationship, having six daughters together but no sons. Their daughters' names were Meritaten, Mikataten, Anxenamun, Nefeneferaten Tasharet, Nefenefera, and Setepenre. Nefertiti held many titles throughout her life, including Hereditary Princess, Great of Praises, Lady of Grace, Sweet of Love, Lady of the Two Lands, Great King's Wife, Lady of All Women, and perhaps most importantly, High Priestess of Artin. Akhenaten and Nefertiti were the primary driving forces behind the religious revolution during this period forcing the people of Egypt to abandon their pantheon of gods in favor of worshipping a single deity named Artin. Artin is best described as being the disc of the sun that was originally an aspect of the sun god Ra. Artistically, Artin is depicted as a solar disc emitting rays with small hands on the ends. The famous stele of Akhenaten appears to show the royal family being touched by the rays of Artin. Worship of Artin was nothing new, and even the previous pharaoh Amenhotep III and Queen Tie had revered Artin above all other gods, but never to the same fanatical extent as Akhenaten and Nefertiti. Queen Nefertiti wielded much greater influence over the empire than previous Egyptian queens and eventually rose from the rank of consort to that of co-pharaoh alongside Akhenaten. Nefertiti is depicted beside her husband in art more often than any other Egyptian queen in history. She is frequently presented in positions of strength and authority, such as conducting worship of Artin, driving a chariot, and smiting enemies of the empire. Nefertiti's sexuality, as evidenced by her exaggeratedly feminine body shape and her fertility, as observed through the six princesses' repeated presence in art, suggests that she was regarded as a living fertility goddess. 
Nefertiti designed a commanding, tall, flat, topped blue crown for herself that is theorized to represent a female version of the Capresh, which was a war crown popularized by Pharaoh Thutmose III a century earlier. By their ninth year in power, Akhenaten and Nefertiti had declared Aten to not only be the supreme god, but the only one worthy of worship. They ordered that temples dedicated to Amun be vandalized or destroyed, and that images containing any god other than Aten be banned. Akhenaten and Nefertiti eventually declared that they were Aten's only messengers, altogether supplanting priests and other religious leaders. The aristocracy viewed this sudden shift towards monotheism as a significant threat to the empire, but largely went along with the royal couple's reforms. Many priests of Amun hid texts and artifacts, saving them from Akhenaten and Nefertiti's wrath. Towards the end of his reign, Akhenaten went as far as to declare himself and Nefertiti actual gods and demanded that they be worshipped as such. Nefertiti was eventually elevated to the position of Egypt's sole pharaoh after the death of her husband, and subsequently changed her name to Nefer Ruiten, meaning beautiful is the beauty of Aten. It's theorized that she might have masqueraded as a male pharaoh named Smenkare as well. As pharaoh of Egypt, Nefertiti undoubtedly became the most powerful woman on earth. Nefertiti holds the distinction of being the second New Kingdom female pharaoh after Hatshepsut, and the fifth of a total of seven women to ever become pharaoh during ancient Egypt's 3,000-year history. Hesitant to relinquish the throne to her nine-year-old stepson, Tutankhamun, Nefertiti wrote to the king of the Hittites, Sepiluliuma I, My husband has died, and I have no son. They say about you that you have many sons. You might give me one of your sons to become my husband. I would not wish to take one of my subjects as a husband, I am afraid." This was an extraordinarily desperate proposition because New Kingdom Egyptian royal women never married foreign royalty. Awestruck by Nefertiti's request, Sepiluliuma responded by sending his son, Prince Ananza, but the marriage never happened because the prince was assassinated en route to Egypt. This attempt to marry a foreigner was likely viewed as treasonous in the eyes of the Egyptian elite, and some have speculated that she was murdered shortly afterwards because Nefertiti soon disappeared from the historical record forever. It's a mystery as to whether Nefertiti died at this time or simply surrendered her throne to Tutankhamun, who married her daughter, Anxenamun. Upon ascending the throne, his advisors convinced the young pharaoh to reject Artinism and restore the traditional worship of Amun and the old gods. He also abandoned his parents' city of Amana and re-established Thebes as Egypt's capital. Tutankhamun's successors, particularly Horemheb, demolished many of Akhenaten and Nefertiti's constructions and used the rubble for their own building projects. Ironically, Akhenaten and Nefertiti are now two of the most notable figures from all of ancient Egyptian history, while most of their detractors have forever vanished into obscurity. In 1912, a German archaeological team led by Ludwig Borchardt unearthed the portrait bust of Nefertiti at the ruins of an Amarna workshop owned by a royal sculptor. The bust was first shown in a Berlin museum in the 1920s, and it quickly gained international notice, rendering Nefertiti one of the most recognizable and beautiful female figures from antiquity. German dictator Adolf Hitler was particularly proud to have Nefertiti's bust in Germany's possession, describing it as a unique masterpiece, an ornament, a true treasure. One of Hitler's top officials, Hermann Göring, considered returning the bust to Egypt as a political gesture, but Hitler strongly disagreed, saying, I will never relinquish the head of the Queen. The bust was hidden away in a German salt mine during the 1945 Allied bombings of Berlin and was discovered by American soldiers near the end of the war. Egypt requested that the United States return the bust to its motherland, but they refused and advised Egypt to take the matter up with the new German government. The bust is currently housed in the Nayez Museum in Berlin, where it had been on display prior to World War II. The location of Nefertiti's tomb remains one of the biggest mysteries in the field of Egyptian archaeology. 
Many Egyptologists believe that finding the legendary queen's tomb will be the most significant discovery since Howard Carter's famous unearthing of Tutankhamun's tomb in 1922. Through her incredible beauty and unparalleled influence, Nefertiti has captivated the world and become one of the most recognizable and legendary figures of the ancient world. Consider liking, commenting, subscribing, and clicking the bell icon below for more videos like this.